In climbing, we can often get really excited when we see the outliers in our community, particularly when it comes to finger strengths and watching these people do incredible feats of strength. Sometimes we often can see patterns when more people start to emerge with these incredible feats of strength and we notice that they're doing similar things in their training. This is something we've observed recently in the arm lifting community. And we're gonna be talking about how their training can translate to our own finger strength. Recently, Tom Randall has been diving deep into the arm lifting community through our podcast and talking to some of the big names in this community. One of the big ones, which you may have heard before, is Yves Gravel. And recently, he sat down with Tom to give us a video about a number of arm lifting techniques, an example session, and some of the training theory that goes behind this strength training. What we're gonna do in this episode is take a number of those clips, some of the golden nuggets that came from that conversation and give them to you as well as talk a little bit about how we can use that in our own training and how that relates to some of us mere mortals which don't have that level of incredible finger strength. Okay so first thing I'll go through I'll just show a little bit of equipment and then I'll show you proper techniques and maybe like some uh, higher uh, higher level techniques and stuff if you want to perform in arm lifting. In the first part of this conversation, Eves goes through the three big training tools that are going to be helping us climbers build our grip strength. This is a lifting edge, a pinch grip, and also a wrist wrench. Or in our case, we're going to be using the heavy roller, which is our new wrist wrench style product. Uh, so the most popular, especially for climbers, is the portable hangboard. So uh, I would recommend, it doesn't really matter the brand, but uh, something that has a good size edge with comfy, uh, comfy radius. So something that's a little bit round so it doesn't damage your skin. So my favorite uh, size rungs that I like to train with is 18. I think this is a really good one to build uh, maximum strength and stuff. It's, it's comfortable, it won't damage your skin. Here, Eves brings up the fact that an 18 mil edge is his preferred or go-to favorite edge for this style of training. Now, this is also pretty common to number of the edges that we use on our hangboard. For example, the 20 mil edge, very similar size with a nice rounded radius, so it's not gonna pull too much on the skin. Comfort is actually really key to this. This edge size is gonna be about the depth of the first pad of your finger. And there's a good amount of research to back up that training on a larger edge is really good for building those maximum strength gains. This doesn't mean that minimum edge training isn't helpful as well, but for the purposes of getting really high loads through the forearm, this is gonna be one of the best edges to go to. And then a pinch block. If I'm pinch pinching for, for grips or something like that, I won't just grab the weight like that. I will use that same part I was using here, so the side of the tongue. So I'll go really deep and get some purchase. And that, and I usually keep my fingers straight. So in climbing, we tend to like, you know, curl our, our fingers like this. We're very strong like that. In grip, we try to get as much skin and contact on the, on the weight as possible to increase the friction. And we'll kind of like pronate a little bit the wrist to kind of like create tension on it. So instead of keeping it just straight, I'll create a little bit of tension. So it kind of like creates tension like this. So it kind of like cans in into my hand. Onto the pinch grip and Eves talks about how being precise with the grip position is really important. There's some nuances into how Eves grips this, but also I think this translates through to all kinds of setups of grip strength training, where it's about setting the grip as best you can to lift that maximum load. And also making sure that you have the same grip every time you pick up off the floor so that you're keeping that consistent in your training. Next one is here's the wrist wrench. So basically it's a tube with a strap around it and there's a lot of ways, different ways to use it. Uh, most of us use it. So we wrap the strap and we keep the size that, that the, the strap is on that that's wrapped. That's where you keep your thumb on it. So this is the method and it's really good to train the, to get very strong wrists and uh, open hand strength. It wants to open up your hand, it wants to open up your wrists. So you'll develop a lot of forearm strength wrist and uh, also squeeze a lot of pin strength as well in this one. So this is the method I like to use. So uh, there's different ways. Some people use it, uh, especially uh, um, arm wrestlers, they'll use it on a nut list type machine, you know, like, uh, and they'll attach it and they'll do like curls and stuff. So that's another one if you want to build a lot of forearm strength and you're more into uh, arm lifting or bodybuilding. So if you kind of roll the weights like that, and you're gonna build very strong forearms and wrists as well. 
while pinch training and pick up edge training feels like something we've actually been doing for a long time in the climbing community and I've now started seeing that crossover with arm lifting using something like the wrist wrench or in our case the heavy roller this is something that has actually been a bit of a happy accident spilling into our community in climbing because we know now that actually it's a really great device for training that pinch strength and also the wrist strength and this is going to transfer really nicely through to sloper strength as well then you'll need a um, lifting pin so this is really great if you want to do anything lifting from the floor this is kind of like a must that you you should get it's going to simplify you can put your plates some are made for uh, olympic size plate with two inch uh, two inch holes and then there's the standard ones that are a little bit more skinny so it depends again on the equipment you have at home or uh, that uh, that you're thinking of purchasing. So just think about that before you select it. If you want to properly get into your arm lifting training, it's good that you have a decent setup. And here, a lifting pin is actually really key to that. Eves makes the point that we can have a one inch or two inch lifting pin. With our lifting pin, we keep it the one inch so that it is versatile enough to take both sides of plates. And for a lot of us at home, if we're training in that environment, we often have these smaller plates which only have that one inch diameter to hold. So the one inch lifting pin works really well for these as well. You want to lift uh, over your shoulders. So your shoulders here, your arms in the center of your body. And you want to lift, you want to put the weight right under your shoulder, okay? Where your armpit is, this is where the, uh, the best place to lift. So you keep your feet as far, far forward as you can. It's usually like in the middle of the feet is good for me. And I'll lift like this. That sets me up in a very safe position, puts the weight right in the middle of my body. We know that exercise form can be really important for potentially protecting structures in our body, but actually it's also very important for getting the most out of the lift. And here, Eves talks us through how to lift the maximum amount of weight by keeping the arm in line with the front of the body so that you're lifting mainly through the legs and you don't have the arm out to the side. One of the mistakes I always see climbers do is they roll the weight. So like this, they have a really long rope and they start rowing the weight. So you're gonna be very limited by the amount of weight you can row other than instead of like the weight you can lift. So ideally you can get a smaller pin, it's gonna help you a lot. So a smaller pin like this, and then this way I can keep my arms straight and just slip with my legs. I don't have to bend my arms. The big mistake here is people shrugging with the shoulder. Now this might be just a mistake in itself, but it might also be an issue to do with the lifting pin length. So make sure that the lifting pin is at a position where that you pick up with a bend in the leg and the lift is mainly just coming from you straightening at the knee. Our lifting pin is compatible with all of our lifting products, so that is at a good height, meaning that you can lift off the floor without needing to shrug at the shoulder at all. With the lifting form down, it is time to jump into our lifting session. Eves is gonna take us through a typical arm lifting session he's gonna do with an 18 mil edge. This is gonna be building up to 80% of his max, but we need to work there first, so we're gonna go through the warm up. There's two sections. So one is my progressive warm up, where I kinda of like build up, uh, build up my reps and my volume up to I get to my main training uh, sets, what I, would, what I would call. Uh, so for today we'll do 80% of my max. That's a really good, uh, good range I think for uh, most uh, strength training protocol. So for this example, just to make it really simple and keep the weights like for the mat for everyone to make it a bit easier, we'll say uh, that my max for 18 millimeter edge is going to be 100 kilos. So I would usually start around 50 or 60% of my one rep max when I warm up, when I, it's, it's not a warm up because it's a specific warm up. So usually I'll do like a little bit of warm up beforehand and then I'll get into these sets. And I found warming up this way really builds a lot of quality into my training and like volume. It also adds up because these, these reps also count, you know, like they're not, uh, I, I count them into my training and it builds a lot of volumes and, and quality as well. Here, we're gonna start at 50% of your one rep max. Eve's example here with lifting 100 kilos off the floor, probably something not everyone can do. He's gonna start with 50 kilos, lifting from the legs, eight full repetitions to complete his first set. And this is the start of his specific warm up. <laughs> 
It's important to note that this is a specific warm up and that you should have done a general warm up before you start doing this, much like you would do in a climbing session. We get some really great tips at this point where Eve talks to us about making sure that we are recording these sets and not skipping them. All of the reps you do in this warm up count towards your overall training volume. So actually working through this is contributing to your training. It's not just about what we would call the working sets or the sets you're doing at 80%. It's about building up to it and making sure that you're recording this in your training and understanding this contributes. I use this hand to set up my other hand really well. I'll keep my shoulder over the device, right over, okay, and I'll lift with my legs. So one, so if I do reps, I just lift up and then I come down. That's how I measure my intensity for this type of, uh, of training, so hopefully. Five, and So I'll, I'll stop here. So around eight, eight reps usually is a good, if I want to keep my energy for the higher reps, usually I'll stop around eight or 10, depending on how I feel. We can think about 10% is a good increment to do on a, on a weight. So if I'm going for 50, I could do 60 is a, is a good increment to do. At this point, we're going to incrementally increase the load by 10% at each time. So at 100 kilos, it's quite simple. That's 10 kilos every time building up to that 80 kilo or 80% of one rep max. Obviously, if you're not doing 100 kilos, these are gonna be smaller, absolute increments of weight, but stick to the 10% rule and that will work for your session. As you're going up, you can really assess. It's like, okay, I'm feeling really good today. You know, I'm gonna be able to push the weights up. I love this clip here because you can see that Eves is lifting fast and he's only lifting to complete the rep before putting it back down. He's not necessarily holding it for time like we would in an isometric contraction. What we're doing here is developing that power to overcome the inertia of the weight, really to get it up. And this is more akin to a climbing move when you actually pull on the hold to initiate the move. It's not just about holding on and dangling like we would in an overhead hangboard session. My main sets would probably be 80s would be a really good uh for most training session, around 80% is really good. Sometimes when I do really high volume, I'll, I'll stop around 70, but I'll do a lot more reps. So still feeling really good. Like, like sometimes I'll, uh, like right now, I feel I feel quite good, so I won't. Maybe I'll. I'll usually I like to stop around six or five when I start to, the weight start to go up, the reps start start to go down till I get to my main set, which usually I do four, four, four repetition at eighty is really good for me. But if I feel really good, sometimes I'll I'll pull a couple extras and I'll, I'll write it down though. It's time for the main set, and we're at around eighty percent of our one rep max. At this point, Eves is going to drop the rep range to around four reps. However, he also makes the point that he's not gonna be really strict on prescribing rep range every session. He's gonna to listen to his body, and if he's feeling good, he might go for five reps or even six reps. It depends on how he's feeling on the day. Importantly, he's not gonna push it if he's not feeling like it. He's not gonna be training to failure because he can't reach those prescribed reps that he had estimated months in advance of this session. I think this is a really powerful lesson to us as climbers because I see it all the time where people wanna chase their PBs. They wanna see their numbers going up at that one rep max or that five second hang. Here, it's about trusting in the process, sticking to the plan, and just accepting that the volume in your training is also a very powerful stimulus. It's not just about the intensity in your training. And then if I'm going, especially in like a uh, specific phase when I'm preparing for an event, then I'll, I'll start jacking up the weights like around 90 or even sometimes I'm doing like heavy singles or doubles and I'll do very few sets. Or sometimes I do a pyramid like I'm doing like that right now. So I'll go up like 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 95, 100, and then I'm done. It's like I'll go up and then stop. Sometimes I'll come back down too, so. This doesn't mean that he's not gonna push the intensity at times. He also makes the point that when it comes to a competition, the rep range is gonna drop down to maybe singles or doubles, pushing up the intensity towards 90, 95% but we're saving that intensity for key times in the year. It's not a year round thing. It's not something we're doing every week.
onto the training theory here. And this is probably what makes the biggest difference. Given the best training plan or training session in the world doesn't necessarily make it effective. It's how you implement it and understand how it's affecting your body. So these bits here that Eves gives us is some absolute gold nuggets of information. Every time I'll do this, I'll assess how am I feeling. So either by a wellness uh, questionnaire. So I was like, okay, how am I feeling the intensity today? It was like, am, am, do I feel pain in my joint, uh, fatigue, anything like that to see, you know, if I'm recovering well from my training or not. On a number of occasions, he talks about listening to his body. And this is really important. It's that form of intrinsic feedback and understanding whether he's having a good session or a not so good session and how he should be pushing the intensity. That self-regulation is something a lot of elite athletes do, but they have a lot of experience as well. They understand what it feels like to be having an off session and when they're responding really well to training. It's not something necessarily you'll do very well straight away, and it can be helpful to have a coach to help guide you through what a good session might feel like and maybe keep things a bit more prescriptive to start with. But over time, letting your body tell you what's good and how hard you should push is a really great way to make sure you're not overdoing it and you're also doing enough to see those adaptations. Another example too I could do of this is like, say if I was, I was lifting right now and I'm at the, my external load, so my, the loads I'm doing, my training lifts feel very hard, but I'm still at low weights. I'm feeling like everything's hard. Usually that's a sign of like you're not adapting really well to your training. So sometimes it's best to kind of like slow down, kind of like go back a few steps and or maybe look at what's going on. Maybe, uh, maybe yeah, maybe sometimes it can be very different things. There's a lot of elements that could be, can affect you. It could be stress, sleep and other things. But you go back and like look at what you're doing in your training or uh, yeah, maybe you're just doing too much so you can s s pull things down a little bit. If it feels hard, you're not adapting very well. I think what Eves is trying to say here is that if you're struggling, it means you're missing something in your training. And he says that you should potentially pull back and look at other factors outside of the training. So your recovery, are you resting enough? Are you eating well? Are you getting good sleep? A lot of time people will just respond to not having a good session with thinking you need to train more, but this is often the last thing you should be doing if you're not responding very well to your training. When I do strength training, or it's always something I've done, but it, I didn't know about it. It took a long time before I actually learned about this principle is I had a, a buffer. So usually when I do a exercise, I don't go to complete failure. I usually stop one or two reps, or if it's time, I'll stop a few seconds before complete fail, like till I fall, you know? So I try to stop before complete exhaustion. So that's something that I always done in my training and uh, that worked really well for me. The principle of a buffer. And Eves even says it took him a long time to figure this out as well. And it's definitely something I've suffered from in the past is always feeling like we need to train to failure to get the most out of the session. If you've got energy left, you should be leaving that in the gym, right? Well, in this case, Eves are talking about this is strength training. Don't train to failure. Often, if we're training, we want the quality to be really high. And sometimes when we train to failure and we empty the tank, leave every last bit on the floor, those last few sets that we put in potentially didn't actually add any more training stimulus to that session. And all we've done is sabotage our recovery for the next session. So I think this is a really good point. You don't have to train to failure in sessions like this, where the aim is building strength. That's another way you can progress a little bit in your training. You can go for like rep PRs instead of just doing like weights, you know? It's like, I feel good, I'm gonna do an extra rep and it feels good. This got mentioned earlier as well with the fact that when we're getting to 80%, we might be aiming for four reps, but if we're feeling good, we can do five reps or maybe even six reps at that weight. And this is a really great way to measure your success in training as well. So a rep PR rather than just a one rep max PR. This is a great way to measure success without doing any additional training. You can see the numbers clearly in your training journal. You did more reps at that weight than you had done previously. And sometimes building the capacity to do more at a sub-maximal intensity is the precursor to you building maximum strength later down the line. Trust in the process and just look for indications that you are progressing in your training rather than feeling that you need to retest all the time. I love to do reps. I don't know why, but for me, uh, I love structuring uh, my volume and intensity with the rep repetition. If I'm doing more, uh, if I'm gonna do hangs, I usually prefer to do it on the on the hang board. Yeah, but for me, from lifting from the floor, this works really well, and I can structure my 
uh, my intensity and it, it would transfer really well to climbing. This might also be an absolute burning question in a number of climbers' minds right now. What about the hangboarding? What about the traditional style of holding onto an edge above your head and holding it for time? Eves mentioned that he does still do this form of training, but for longer isometrics, he likes to use the hangboard and not this pickup arm lifting style. However, that the arm lifting repetition style still transfers really well to his climbing, which is obviously very important to us. How much I'm gonna lift is gonna depend on what I'm training for. Am I training for a grip event? Am I training for a, a long boulder? I'm gonna look at the, if it's a nine, nine move boulder or something like that and I have to be on for about 40 seconds, then I'll try to match that to my training and that's gonna dictate what I lift. This last bit is gonna be really important to any of you hardcore boulders out there which are trying to really narrow in that focus of training to a specific project. Eves mentions that if he is training for a specific project, he's gonna make this training fairly specific to that project. The example here is a 40 second long boulder, or the boulder takes roughly 40 seconds to climb. He's gonna be doing a number of reps for a similar time under tension, so that it's replicating the similar amount of moves and similar amount of time on the wall. Big respect to Yves Gravel for sharing this information with us and letting us share it on our channel. I'll put a link in the descriptions below to his social media and also his YouTube channel where you can catch him sending some of the most finger intensive boulders in the world. If you wanna check out any of the arm lifting products available in our store, I'll drop a link in the description below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.